Welcome to the Shared Power Podcast, a limited series for organizations and leaders committed to collectively advancing justice and equity. I'm your host, Mia Henry. I'm the CEO of Freedom Lifted and the daughter of activists, educators, entrepreneurs, and survivors. I've had the honor of teaching, facilitating, and co-leading in nonprofits and schools for over two decades. I've learned a lot, but it hasn't always been easy. There are conversations that I had, or I wish I had, that create the conditions for more effective collective leadership. In this podcast, we will explore some of these conversations, diving deeply into topics that will help us learn to build trust, navigate conflict, and lead in partnership with one another. If you believe that relationship building is the foundation for effective work for justice, you are in the right place. Join me as we explore the ingredients of leading with shared power. Today's conversation will feature the incredible Miriam Kaba, an abolitionist organizer and prolific educator who is a sage and a guide in movements for racial, gender, and transformative justice. Miriam and I worked together when she co-founded the Chicago Freedom School and approached me about becoming the first director. Now, because everyone always does anything Miriam asked them to do, I applied was hired and had a chance to work alongside her as a board chair for several years. Around the same time, Miriam also founded and is currently the director of Project NIA, a multimodal transformative justice initiative that works to end the incarceration of children and young adults. She is also a researcher in residence at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Miriam is also the author of several books, including her latest with Kelly Hayes, Let This Radicalize You, Organizing and the Revolution of Reciprocal Care. Miriam has a massive social following and has used this to raise resources and really shift the conversation about the role of policing and prisons in our society. Today, we talk about how activists and movement leaders can engage, collaborate, and connect on social media in ways that remain genuine, healthy, and authentic. Here's my conversation about building power with Miriam Kaba. So grateful for your time, Miriam, and and um, yeah. so you're one of the first people I thought of to talk talk about this, and um, I know that you have you know so much rich experience organizing folks, but also because I had the the honor of working with you behind the scenes um, to build an organization years ago. Yeah, um, I know that you do this. You know, you're about it when when people aren't looking as well. Mm-hmm. This conversation I wanted to be about communication, how um, we can create lines of communication. I don't want to say always open because people think about that as always talking, but just all the ways that we are able to tell each other, not only what we think about things like our opinions, but how we feel and how we, how we come to the work and how we dream forward. Just how do we communicate that? Mm. And now since in the, you know, since we worked together years ago, social media has become such a, I mean, it's, it's. Yeah. Ubiquitous. It, yeah. It's, it's everything, you know, <laughs> for, for organizing and, um, and you have used it uh, mm-hmm. so well. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, why do you think it's important to have a lot of avenues to reach people, you know, when challenging the status quo? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that for my end, um, I don't think that, I think people will listen to people who they first and foremost trust that in the sense here of somebody who you feel is authentically believing what they say, um, that you have to, you have to believe that person somehow. And the way you believe a person is you establish, you have to have had some kind of relationship, even if it's a parasocial one, where you've seen this person say a thing over and over again, you've seen how they show up in space over and over again. And then you say, okay, I think this person is authentic. And even if I disagree with them, I think they've authentically come to their understanding of whatever the situation is, whatever the thing is. I think that it matters uh, still that you have some expertise in the things that you're talking about. 
even in the era of this kind of weird social media landscape that we are inhabiting, you have to have some claim to some form of uh, knowledge that you've come to because you've done something around that. I know there's a lot of talk about like anybody can come on the internet and make themselves look like an expert. That may be true. That doesn't last long. People Mm. will find you out because over time you're going to, you know, spectacularly uh, implode or you're going to make a mistake or you're going to do something and people will find out that you didn't really know as much as you proclaim that you knew. But you can do it in a short burst, but you can't do it long term. I got on social media quite against my will because I'm actually a Luddite. I um, <laughs> you know, still have a flip phone. I don't have a smartphone, you know, all these things that I have. Um, and so I um, I came to social media because a young person, you won't be surprised, is the person who said to me years ago, Miss Kaba, you should have your own blog because you got stories and you can talk about all the stuff you're doing and all this other stuff. And I was like, I'm not getting a blog. Okay, I'm not getting a blog. I don't even know what a blog is. I'm not doing it. I don't know how I would even work it. Like, what is it, you know? <laughs> How would I do the the technology? I'm not doing it. And this young person was persistent um, and said, I'll make it for you. And I was like, I'm not going to use, you know, whatever. So one day um, they came to my office and they helped me set up this blog on WordPress, which turned out to be prison culture, which tells you everything you need to know, because I didn't name yeah. it after myself. I did not mm-hmm. use it in the blog. I was blogging anonymously. And it was that young person who connected the blog automatically to Twitter. That happened in 2010. And so when I would blog a post, it would automatically post to Twitter. And I I did not know that. Yes, that's how that happened. So I didn't even... I, I didn't go into like the thing. I used the blog exactly as the young person suggested to, that I ought to use it. He was like, you should blog about the work you do. Because this is a young person who was in conflict with the law, who I was working with through Project Nia work, and um, you know, would hear me tell stories about various things and people and stuff like that. And was um and he was the one who really said, you know, I really appreciate like the stuff I hear from you, the stories you tell, and I think other people will as well. And what that just showed me the importance of is that the intention behind the medium of communication that you're using and kind of what you're trying to do matters quite a bit because I was not intending, I used basically this blog as my work journal. That's Mm -hmm. how I saw it. That was what I was using it for. I wasn't using it to like build a platform for myself or, you know, do anything really besides like, post the things that I was doing work-wise and kind of movement stuff together in one place that was just not my journal, but was like a place that was more public. I never anticipated that a lot of people would care about it. That wasn't why I did it. And so when more and more people started caring about it, then it was interesting to me because the other thing that I think is important to say is by the time I started prison culture, I'd already been organizing for decades. Like I had already been doing the work I was doing for a long time. I wasn't a young person. And I think that also mattered. I got on social media when I was already at that point in my, um, was I almost 40, I think at that time. Yeah, that would be right. Um, I was almost 40 at that time. And so I already had like a life, I already had been doing a lot of things, I already had something to talk about. And I think that also made a difference as to people hearing what I had to say, and believing that I had done the things that I had said I had done, because there was actual proof of those things in the world, you know? Yeah. Um, And so yeah, so all of that, stuff around communication. I don't think you can just talk and invite people to do stuff if they don't trust you. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can just invite people in to do stuff if maybe you haven't tried anything before that they can look back on and say, oh, this person has a potential track record about this stuff. Maybe I should join in on what they're doing. And then you can't 
invite people if there isn't a sense of radical hospitality. I really believe in that. I think you have to, I think invitations have to be consistent. You have to offer them over and over again. I think you have to be in a position in a place where, again, people think you know what you're talking about, or at least you know what you're doing in some way in order for them to join you. I think that makes a difference. So that's what I would say about how um, how I've been using social media to invite people. And I also never saw social media as something that was opposite of what I was already doing in general organizing. Mm -hmm. For me, it's just a tool. It always has been. It's like we say in organizing, meet people where they are. Well, there are a lot of people on social media, right? There are a yeah. lot of people who exist there. So why wouldn't you like try to rally them or mobilize them towards an action if you are somebody who wants to transform the conditions in which we live, if you are trying to do stuff in the world in some way, why should social media be not an important site of struggle? It's a site of struggle like every other site of struggle we engage in. Our neighbors are sites of struggle, our you know institutions are sites of struggle. Social media has to be, I mean, there are millions upon millions of people on social media. To say that you're just not even going to engage there is silly if you're an actual organizer. It doesn't make any sense. So you have to engage. Um, there's many ways that you can do that. You, it doesn't have to be all on a platform that's owned by somebody else. P people are creating discords. People are creating smaller communities. People have created gaming communities. People have commu All sorts of communities exist. And I think there's a lack of differentiation sometimes when people pick one platform and they're like, oh, this place is horrible. Well, a blog is a social media platform, you know? Yeah. No, I totally, I totally agree. I mean, you've talked talked about so many things, and I, um, it's just so wonderful to hear you recount um, the your journey mm -hmm. to this to using uh, Twitter. Yeah, and um, because I think that we have you know, people think about overnight, you know, they think everything's happening overnight, you know, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing. And it, it was so for me, when I, when I saw you getting such a huge following on Twitter, it was anyone who's known you was, is just like relieved and happy, you know, <laughs> I think, cause I'm like, thank God, you know, <laughs> that <laughs> someone who does the work is putting, you know, things out there and people are listening, you know, yeah. and paying attention. Uh, because there, there is, there's a lot of other things going on, there you know, are. in the medium. Yeah. It's a noisy space, and I really appreciate you too expanding the definition of social media for people who organize. Um, yeah. Because I know I've I've struggled with the the different platforms and trying yeah. to figure out uh, um, what makes sense and being kind of overwhelmed and pressure, feeling pressure even to be on all the things everywhere. Yeah. You don't need to. You do. You really don't need to. And, you know, I have a lot of small gatherings yeah. of, you know, a few people on a regular basis for years. And that is part of it. That's part of it, too. It's being yeah. it's using a medium to be social. <laughs> it's using a medium to be social. And it's also uplifting the virtual space. And yes. I mean, if we have learned nothing, right? from the last three years of being in a global pandemic, it's how incredibly critical the infrastructure of the virtual is yeah. and how it will only become more so in the future. It isn't going to get less so. And I don't, I'm yeah. not the of the belief that people have, which is that everybody got so Zoomed out that now they're not gonna be on Zoom and everybody's gonna be quote in real life. It's the same conversation that's being had about remote work as though remote, wo remote work isn't here to stay. Remote work has been here to stay and it's just gonna get more and more real as more and more people become more global in how they do things and where we actually have to figure out ways to communicate with each other across borders. You know, th this, this stuff is here to stay and we're gonna have to yeah. figure out how to use it in ways that are healthy rather than in toxic ways, which 
a lot of people, some people fall into online because they, you know, because of the anonymity that it can give you and the, the license that it can give you to act out of your, out of your values as a result of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I can't, you know, the putting a lot of the content that I used to do in trainings online, you know, I know uh, because I've, you know, partnered with you and you have, uh, you and yeah. the just practice, good people just practice have put so much um, asynchronously as well. And that was just a game changer for, a game. for my work, yeah. you know, giving people time to process things on their own in their own time too. Huge. And huge. huge. Going at their own pace in yeah. a way that really going at your own pace, not like the fake going at your own pace. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I, oh no, we don't have a lot of time, so. It's okay. Yeah, take your time. I'm I'm around actually until twelve thirty. So if if you all want to go a little longer, it's fine. Oh, okay, Cassandra, are you okay with that? Oh, great, 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 great. Um, yeah. So I think I'm. You know, I think it's safe to say though, with the with the language that people use today, I think it's safe to say, Miriam, that you are an influencer, whether you like that term or not. No, what a mess. <laughs> I know, you know, people respect what you, you believe and they do what you say. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I know that this is not all that it's cracked up to be right. (laughs) Um, it's people try to put you on a pedestal, I'm sure. Yeah. And you know, and you get on a pedestal then you can be either worshiped or they can come for you, you know? Absolutely. So it's not, and, and I know celebrity, you know, hasn't gone to your head. It will not. And it has not, um, because I know you and then you've taken this time to talk about the roots of how you came to be known in, in such a, in such a broad way to so, so many people. Um, you use all this power <laughs> to pour right back into movement work. Yeah. And I, it's something I deeply respect and I, I don't think I've ever had a chance to, to tell you that. So I want you to know that. And I see it and I know mm-hmm. others all of us um, who've known you for a while see it and appreciate it. It's so critical because once people are, you know, they try to make you an individual and not part of the collective. That's right. You know, it leads to the problems of envy and status scrambling and all this yeah. stuff. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And we know that this historically, you know, runaway egos, that'll, that'll kill our movements, you know? Oh, yep. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. We're not naming any names. We just know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just a quick break to note that the Shared Power Podcast is sponsored by Freedom Lifted and our flagship training program, Justice at Work. Justice at Work offers blended learning and professional development for organizations and individuals who are strengthening their commitment to justice and equity in their workplaces and in their communities. This training combines discussions with online modules that teach frameworks and critical history to help you examine the relationship between identity and power. You'll even have opportunities to join live group discussions facilitated by me, Mia Henry. Go beyond diversity and inclusion to find your role in building a more just and equitable world. Learn more and sign up at freedomlifted.com. <laughs> um, so how do you always make sure that the messaging stays about the message? and not the messenger. That's a hard thing. I mean, I feel like I don't control what other people think of me. Um, I think that what is in my control is how I show up and who I am and whether I can work towards shrinking the distance between my values and my actions every day. Mm -hmm. And I try to really live into that at every time, at every turn. I, I'm not, um, I think people sometimes think that like people have a persona online and then they are themselves in a different place. Like how exhausting might that be to actually do that? I have too much going on to have to have like many different personas. I am, you know what I mean? Like I have enough going on. So for me, it's like, I am me 
wherever I am, wherever I go, there I am. And so that's what I take. And I, and I also am deeply, as you know, it matters to me a lot to do things with other people. I like it. It's how I think we should live in the world. And so I collaborate a lot with many different kinds of people. So therefore, if I'm in the process of doing something, it's not me alone. It's other people doing it with me. And so I'm always going to bring the whole entire group of folks that are doing that and lift them up alongside because their labor is why we're able to produce anything at all. So, yeah, so I really take that quite a bit seriously. And in terms of using social media to like put a light on things that I think matter and are useful, why if I actually have a way to get people to connect around something or to be part of something. So why wouldn't I take that opportunity to actually use what um, whatever it is, like that people's trust in me or people's people valuing what I have to say about something to actually bring other people into the mix as well. So, hey, everybody, there's this really good work going on here. Please pay attention to that too is like the very bare minimum that I ought to be doing all the time. And really, honestly, none of this is about me as a singular person, as one individual. I don't want to think of the world as individualistic in that way. I believe in the fact that connection is our currency. That really means something to me in a real sense. And that connection is how we survive, right? We come into the world already part of a community of two. We are connected to another human when we come into the world. That is actually something that should tell us that that is the way we have to be in the world, is in community and connection with others. And that that's the only way we're actually going to survive. So I really, like I take that to heart and that's how, that really guides how I am in social life, uh, in social media, in my private life. I really try to live by that. So I think that's that's what's kept me be uh, kept me connected because I'm connected. Yeah. Um, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like people would tell me, "What the hell are you doing?" I have there are people in my life, many who would intervene if they saw some shady things going on or me doing something that kind of is out of pocket for me. Like, Mm -hmm. what are you really about here, Miriam? Like, what's going on? We see you doing this stuff out in the world and it just doesn't feel aligned. Or like, is this really what you want to be into? I have people all over me, like all my close friends, all my comrades, my family members who aren't afraid to ask me questions ever about anything. Or to bring up like, hey, maybe consider this, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so that's a big part of it is like when they say, you know, do you have people? I have people. I really do. They wouldn't allow me to be going off randomly half cocked doing a bunch of horrible things in the world. Just wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't sit well with them, you know? Yeah. That to me is, is the shared power piece. <laughs> it's having... What you described to me is having that ethos, that value, you're anchored in a value. Power is always shared, right? Always. We're going to move forward. Always. Um, And then do you talk about having, you know, you have people and that's when I see people kind of spiraling or, you know, these things getting to them, the, the attention, right? Yes. I I do sometimes feel there's a sense of loneliness there. Absolutely. Um, And of not caring. Not meaning that not them not caring, but of people not caring about for them. them. Yeah, for them. Of people not caring about them. Yeah. And I think that's the saddest thing ever. When I see things like that, Mm -hmm. I'm like, where are people's people? Why aren't they? And I know, you know, you're a human being and you have agency and not everybody can tell you anything or everything. But it, it just seems to me that if you're unconnected to a whole, if you're out there spiraling and no one is coming for you, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No one cares enough to like step in and be like, this is a problem, you know? I'm concerned and is willing to break the relationship in order to be honest. Yeah, a pull aside. A pull aside. In private. Yes, a a check-in 
is this is this really where you want to go with this? Are you doing okay? What's mm -hmm. happening? This is mm -hmm. and also people have to know that it's out of character for you. So how do they know that? It, they have to know your character. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for that. I think that's such an important thing for us to all keep in mind when, especially when you don't know, like you couldn't anticipate the attention that yeah. prison culture would get. You know? I could not. I could not anticipate it. I did not anticipate it. And more than that, I did not actually, I didn't actively court it. Like I don't actively go out of my way to try to be something that I'm not. I really value, I value my privacy. I do. Yeah, it sounds I really weird to say that that's the case given that I'm public in that way, but I'm only public in a certain way. Mm -hmm. There's a huge part of my life that no one knows anything about as it should be, you know? And again, I told, I said before that it matters that I was older because I already had lived my 20s and 30s by that point. You, know? right. <laughs> you lived them and you already had your people. Your people weren't coming through yes. the platform. You already yes. had them. I so had them. That yeah. is so critically important. They were my people before and they're my people now and they will be my people forever, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you talked about radical hospitality um, mm -hmm. before and... Um, I, so I want to, I want to move to this, how you communicate to invite people in to how you communicate to inspire people to act. Right. Mm -hmm. And that radical hospitality that you mentioned before to me is, is connected to this because I saw it firsthand working mm -hmm. alongside you with CFS at CFS. And it wasn't, you know, certainly with the freedom school, but the, we had a space where you were able to experiment and start a lot of other things happening <laughs> in the space. Right. And so it was always like you, you, you had a way to not only invite people to think differently, but find ways to get people to get involved. Yes. And act. Yeah. Um, and I sometimes really struggle with this, Miriam, because I want people to just look around and see what needs to be done and do it. <laughs> You know, yeah. uh, but you really understand that people don't always see what needs no. to be done no. um, and they need to be offered some action steps. So yeah. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the ways you communicate strategically, you know, to inspire people to act. Yeah, I it is my deep belief. And I've been I, for me, it's been borne out that um, most people don't know what to do. And I think that's not a knock on human beings. That's more a knock on the fact that we shouldn't have to do the things that we are doing. In order to live, in order to live with dignity, we shouldn't have to struggle and fight so hard. And so the fact that people don't exactly know how to step into taking action is not shocking. In fact, that's, that should be like the de facto norm is people are just trying to live. And so to ask them to also come up with a plan for how to do X, Y, Z is unfair in my opinion. Like actually it's unfair. So them not knowing where to step in or what a point of entry looks like is like normal. And we should therefore, those of us who maybe can think in a broad way that way or are feeling like we can intervene in those kinds of ways, right? We mm -hmm. should be open to asking and offering entry points to people at all times. And it has to be consistent and often. And we have to share them over and over and over again. Repetition here is key to the communication. People have to feel like if something's going on, maybe they can even look to you to be like, hey, I don't know where to go here. Can you support? Can you help? Like I see that as just part of being a person on the earth. I don't see it as an imposition. I don't think it's a burden. I think some people know how to plug in and that's great. And I think other people don't know where to plug in and there needs to be there need to be people who are um, offering themselves up as a guide or as hey, I'm doing this. Come in. Join. Be part of this with us. Doesn't mean everybody will stay. They often will not. Retention is a reality of uh, its own work, you know, but 
at least they might come in the door and you might have a better shot at being able to do something that is much more impactful because more people have joined. We always need more people. So we have to do constant invitations. And those invitations have to come with, you know, if you come here, I guarantee that at least I'll be present alongside you, maybe, to be able to do these X other things that are happening. You know, if you come here, we'll have a place where we'll have food. We'll have a place where we might have other kinds of fellowship develop. Doesn't mean we'll all be friends. That's not the necessary. We don't have to be friends to work together. We might just be comrades. Um, so yeah, so all of those are things that I find to be important. But the most important point I just want to, you know, raise and, and put on the table is, to me, it matters quite a bit that we actually offer points of entry, because people don't automatically know how to connect. And if you don't know how to connect, or you don't know what you don't know, having clear points of entry is really, really helpful um, because it allows more people to step in um, to do this work with us, um, to be part of these spaces with us. And I don't see that as an imposition or a burden. I see that very much as part of the work of doing this kind of work. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, once they come in and, and once people come in and they have something to do, right? Um, yeah. We feel that's a small part. That's a tiny part of the, the ongoing stuff. People come in and they have stuff to do, and that's not the end at all. That's like the beginning of the beginning. Yeah. And I, I, I you know, I think that all of your work when you're writing and, and you're speaking is always like do something. You know, <laughs> yeah. just do something. I was on a on a webinar recently uh, hearing you. I think it was, well, it was definitely for, and I just want to, again, congratulate you if I hadn't done it already on you and Kelly Hayes, amazing Kelly Hayes, on the yeah. uh, Let This Radicalize You Organizing and the Revolution of Reciprocal Care. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I was in a virtual like launch for that. And then I was in yeah. something else you were doing for, for libraries because you are starting the For the People Libraries or has started the For the People Libraries mm -hmm. work. And um, yeah, it's always like, you know, just, just, we got to, you got to do something. And you said earlier too, and I think about this a lot, people come in, they may not stay for a long time, but they may come back. You know, yes. <laughs> if yeah. if they if, if we are treating each other well in the movement, capa yeah. our capacity changes over time and in life. Yeah. But we know what's what's possible. Yes. When we work Absolutely. together. So we come back because there are entry points throughout our lives. It's not just and like now or never. You should, and you should also never be upset if people move on, especially if they're moving on for their own reasons and it's not because of a main conflict or something that right. is, you know, negative. People will Eb, things ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. Our lives mm -hmm. ebb and flow. People move to new places. People have children. People get into new stages of their lives. It isn't a it isn't a failure to uh, not have people stay a million years in one thing. It's actually a uh, good thing to have a constant dynamic space and a dynamic organization, but you have to have the infrastructure to support that. And that's the point. Yeah. That's the thing that I've struggled over the years to try to figure out is like, how do we keep the welcoming committee group going? How do we onboard people regularly? How do we orient people to what our values are regularly. We're, how do we make that part of the work happen? That's been the hardest thing I see. Mm. Um, and that's where a lot of, a lot of uh, problems I find locate themselves. It's like, okay, people have come in. You may have had the original orientation. You may have set the values. And then you still need all this infrastructure to help people stay in the work and that is exhausting because that can be then take up all the valuable energy and time from doing the actual work you came together to do um yeah. and that's always a struggle in organization um and i'm still i'm still really working on that and trying to figure out those parts um of the work and i know that the same people shouldn't have to do everything but often we don't have enough people within our organizations to do everything. Yeah. And so it ends up taxing people. And that's a struggle. That's a struggle. Yeah. And it's hard for us to give up things when we don't have enough people. 
because sometimes yes. we need to just pause on some things yes. when we don't have yes. enough. And that's difficult to do because everything it's feels so hard. necessary urgent. now. Mm-hmm. Everything seems urgent. Everything mm-hmm. feels urgent. Some things are urgent, but we also have to be committed to getting some work done that we said we were going to do together. There are other people on the other end of that work that need us and need to, us to be consistent and trustworthy and showing up to It's hard. It's hard all along, all along the way. Yeah. Well, this, there's, this has been so such a gift to be able to talk to you about these things. And I, uh, again, people, this podcast is for folks who are, you know, working, primarily working in organizations and, and collectives, yeah. right? Trying to it, it anchor themselves in, in justice work. Um, yes. And, you know, and I, and I hope thinking about power with, right? Um, and, and, yes. and even in our, in how we relate to ourselves and each other in yes. every day. So we'll- I love it. I love it. I can't wait to see hear the other episodes in the podcast. I'm going to share it with other people and organizations because we need these conversations. We need these sp- these spaces with each other to be able to think through what we've done, where we've gone wrong, where we can build and, and learn again and do better next time. And in a way that's not about, um, I always say like evaluation is about improving. It's not about just listing off all the things you've done wrong. And it's not about a punitive mindset. Evaluation is for improving, doing better next time, engaging, always going to the next level of improving whatever is going on. That's why evaluation, as you know, I I think about it. It's so, it's so incredibly important in our organizations, but not the way that the capitalist model has imposed evaluation on us. And we always feel like we're being judged Mm -hmm. and we're being, Mm -hmm. you know, bludgeoned with like a whole bunch of tools that don't even help our work to grow. Right. Like, no, it's the, it's, be like a bottom up, you know, we want to ask questions because we want to continuously improve right. and, and, you know, figure out better ways of relating with each other. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. Is there anything else you wanted to share with people about how to communicate either internally or externally? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I just want to, you mentioned the new book, um, uh, Let This Radicalize You. We have a section in the book. Um, we have a lot of sections in the book that speak to some of what we talked about today, including a section pretty early on that says, you know, uh, facts are not enough, uh, which again, speaks to a lot of organizers who think like giving everybody the facts means all of a sudden that you're going to get people to act and more importantly, to act in the ways that you would like them to act. And that like, could not be a bigger fallacy uh, for many reasons including like the political psychology of how we how we think and how we work as human beings. So there's a lot in the book um, that if folks want to pick it up, you're welcome to it. Um, and I think it'll support some of the stuff we talked about here today. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Shared Power Podcast. This podcast is a production of Freedom Lifted, a company that provides training, facilitation, and coaching for leaders rooted in justice and equity. It is produced and edited by Cassandra Sampson at It's 97. Production support also provided by Alicia Tate, Amber Kinney, Alicia Bunger, and the AK Collective. For more information about our work, visit freedomlifted.com or follow us at Freedom Lifted on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Join us next time as we continue to unlock the ingredients for leading with shared power.